Okay, welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your uh, weekly SETI seminar series. Uh, today, we're very fortunate to be losing our screen on the right-hand side. There we go. Uh, to be joined by uh, Jeff Marcy, Professor Jeff Marcy from UC Berkeley. Uh, he, uh, Jeff uh, attended uh, UCLA for his uh, BA in Physics and Astronomy, uh, and then uh, did a PhD at... Uh, Santa Cruz, University of Santa Cruz, University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, and uh, after that, he uh, went to uh, Carnegie Institute of Washington to uh, be, be a Carnegie Fellow for a couple of years. Uh, and then he returned to the Bay Area uh, and uh, was on the staff at the San Francisco State University. Uh, in 99, he uh, moved to Berkeley. Uh, Jeff is the uh, uh, a very well-known scientist who has uh, ac accomplished a great deal in his career, particularly regarding exoplanets. He discovered 70 of the first exo 100 exoplanets uh, that were found. He has uh, numerous awards, including uh, California Scientist of the Year in 2000. Uh, he has a, the Harry Draper Medal from the National Academy of Sciences, the Beatrice Tinsley Prize from the American Astronomical Society. Uh, he is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And the Shaw Prize, uh, he's presented many uh, lectures uh, in, in his career, uh, including uh, uh, those that achieved the Carl Sagan Prize for Science Popularization. Today, Jeff is uh, going to talk to us about his latest work and uh, give us a hint about what he's up to now. Uh, and uh, he's going to talk to us about the search for Earth-like planets and also uh, it's linked to intelligent life in the universe. So if you'll join me in welcoming Jeff. I turned it. Uh, I may be a bit loud. <laughs> and did you buy it? Oh, yeah. Well, I'm moved to be here tonight uh, because I think this is a, a special moment uh, not just uh, this year, but I think it's a special moment in uh, human history. And that may sound like an over-the-top comment. I'll try to explain to you why I think uh, in the realm of science and actually in uh, the human uh, exploration of our universe, we are at a, a special moment. And indeed, I think it's fair to say that in science, occasionally questions that have puzzled humans for thousands of years suddenly uh, come up on the horizon and you can almost taste the answer. Uh, the, the cure for penicillin, uh, the, the cure for, for, for uh, uh, bacterial diseases that required penicillin was one such quest that we humans eventually solved. Uh, Armstrong's step on the moon you knew what was going to happen a, a year or two beforehand. Uh, the, the solving of the human genome, we knew, uh, could see it coming over the horizon. And we have a similar quest uh, that's been going on for over 2,000 years. And that is solving the question of whether there are other Earth-like planets elsewhere in the universe. How common are Earth-like planets? And is there, in fact, any life on those planets? questions that Aristotle and his philosophical friends uh, pondered uh, in the suburbs of, of Athens, somewhat behind closed doors. Now, here over 2,000 years later, we're really poised to answer the questions that, that represent the title of my talk. And so I'm going to try to give you a, a, a feeling for how close we are to answering uh, these epochal questions. And I'll start uh, with some acknowledgments because I'll be representing uh, a, a group of over a hundred scientists, uh, some funded by NASA. Um, I have close collaborators you see named here, Andrew Howard, John Johnson, Deborah Fisher, Howard Isaacson, Jason Wright. Um, 
The uh, Ken and Gloria Levy have been very generous, allowing the research to happen without uh, the generous donations of a few people. We couldn't do our research. The NASA Kepler team is going to play a, a crucial role. There's about 100 scientists and engineers, and I'll be trying to represent the work that they've done. Uh, leaders Bill Baruki and Dave Koch. Ball Aerospace built the Spaceborne Telescope I'll be telling you about. And there are a group of wonderful scientists and friends, uh, some of whom are named here that work on Kepler with me. Uh, I've pointed out a few of them who are really leading the, the charge with Kepler. Uh, Ted Dunham, uh, Nick Gautier, John Jenkins, who's in the audience here, uh, Doug Caldwell, Steve Bryson, Natalie Battaglia, and, and many others. Um, making the, the Kepler mission happen. And the, the main point is that, that science these days is, is quite a group effort and we couldn't solve a question like the one you see here, is anybody out there, uh, without a, a joint effort of a large number of people. So it is in fact the case that here in 2011 we still don't know of any life elsewhere in the universe except for right here on the planet Earth. It's almost embarrassing that after 40 years of science fiction on TV in the form of Star Trek and, and Star Wars in the movies, we still don't know of any life elsewhere except for right on our own home planet. And of course, uh, this is uh, not for lack of trying. Uh, NASA and now in Europe, ESA are exploring the, uh, the planets and the moons in our solar system, hunting for life, either microbial or perhaps even larger. Uh, Mars is an obvious destination. Uh, the moons of Jupiter and Saturn are excellent destinations. Uh, many of them have a lot of water. Uh, and so there's clearly a great quest for humanity in the upcoming decade or two, hunting for life within our solar system. But I can tell you the, the sort of sobering news right off the bat. There is no other intelligent life elsewhere in our solar system. The satellites we've already sent to all the planets show that there are no smart critters with big brains walking on the surface of Venus or Mercury or Mars. Uh, so the, the quest for, for other intelligent beings really takes us out of the solar system and into the Milky Way galaxy with its 200 billion stars and the hunt is now on for Earth-like planets in our Milky Way galaxy orbiting other stars that might be suitable for life as we know it. Now we do have some advanced notions as to whether Earth-like planets uh, should be common or rare. And those notions come from studying the uh, infant stars that we see literally being born out of the gas and dust in our Milky Way galaxy. And here you see a picture of the Orion Nebula, a very famous star forming region. It is a mere one million years old and within it young stars are condensing out of the gas and dust that make up the Orion Nebula, the, the middle star in the sword of the Orion uh, constellation. And in fact if you zoom in closely to those young stars you'll see that the young stars are usually accompanied by some uh, thin, flattened, opaque material uh, that blocks the middle of the star. Sometimes you see the opaque material surrounding the star. And that is a platter of gas and dust, the placental material out of which the star formed, but within which planets can form, including the large ones the size of Jupiter, gaseous ones, and small ones the size of the Earth that might be rocky. There's plenty of building block material in these protoplanetary disks. And so the, the cartoon that you should take away from this introduction is that we already know that around young stars as they form, there's also material around the young stars within which the comets, the asteroids, and the planets themselves can form in a growth sequence that you see at the bottom with the small pebbles colliding, sticking, and growing into ever larger bodies, eventually the size of planets. So the, the, the search is clearly warranted to hunt for Earth-sized uh, and maybe even Earth-like planets around other stars. And the best way to do it, it turns out, is with a space-borne telescope called Kepler. And here's how it works. As an unseen 
Earth-sized planet crosses in front of a star, it will block a small fraction of the starlight, and so the star will dim. You can't see the star's disk. You certainly can't see the planet. It's lost in the glare of the host star. But you can monitor the brightness of the star minute after minute after minute, hoping to make a graph of brightness versus time, seeing the star dim simply due to this uh, crossing Earth-sized planet. You need to be above the Earth's atmosphere to do this uh, photometry, as it's called. And the reason is, is that the Earth's atmosphere uh, causes stars to shimmer and uh, fluctuate in their brightness. And so only with a space-borne telescope like Kepler can you measure the brightness precisely enough to detect a tiny planet the size of the Earth in the face of its enormous host star. So here's Kepler. Uh, we had uh, uh, hopes to launch it two years ago in March of 2009. You see it here on the launch pad. And I think the next slide might be the, uh, the launch in March. Minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, it's engine start, 1, 0, and liftoff of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in some way like our own. Chamber pressures are building. Groundlet solid motors are building with chamber pressure. Increasing at this time. Pressure's looking good. It's powered by solid rocket Second boosters. You can see the solid rocket boosters. Recovering from the initial launch transients. The telescope is up at the nose cone up here. Passing 34 seconds. Mach 1. Vehicle's now going supersonic. Motor uh, chamber pressure is uh, beginning to trail off as we're passing 45 seconds. Engine uh, chamber pressure, good steady state value. Symmetrical burn on the uh, groundlet solids. Coming up 55 seconds. Anyway, we have a sequence on channel one. Sequence. Standing by for burnout. Zero three. Burning out of the solids. Four nine. Four for separation. Seven decimal four six five. Seat separation, and we have ignition of the airlit solid motors. Airlit solid motors building in chamber pressure. It's it's really worth remembering that uh, we are indeed living in a special time in which launches like this almost always succeed. We almost take them for granted, and it's a tribute to our civilization and our species that we're able to send uh, machines out into space. Uh, position them precisely, uh, sort of without uh, much more trouble than you know making your breakfast in the morning. It's it's a marvelous. We should be applauding ourselves that we have NASA, that NASA can do these things, born of all the work of the engineers and scientists, scientists that made it possible. Um, Kepler is itself an amazing telescope. Uh, the mirror is one meter in diameter. Hubble, for comparison, is 2.4 meters, so it's a little smaller than Hubble. But what's special about Kepler allows it to do things that Hubble can't even dream of doing. Namely, it has an enormous field of view, 10 degrees by 10 degrees. That's 20 full moons by 20 full moons. It, it, at the back of it, it has a 95 megapixel camera so that it can take pictures of the full 10 degrees by 10 degrees. And what that allows Kepler to do is monitor the brightness of 150,000 stars minute after minute after minute after minute. Already in my talk this, this evening, Kepler has taken six or seven snapshots, and it'll continue to do so during the talk. Um, what's remarkable is that it co-adds those pictures into 30-minute bins, so every 30 minutes we get a new measure of the brightness of each star, good to a few parts per million, quite remarkable, and it's supposed to do this for three and a half years, hopefully six or seven years if we get a little more money, which is what we're, we're hoping for. And the truly remarkable capability of Kepler that blows everything else out of the water is that it measures the brightnesses of stars to one one hundredth of one percent of the brightness of the star. So if the star should dim by even one part in 10,000, Kepler will catch that. And that's exactly the amount by which a star dims when an Earth-sized planet crosses in front. 
It's just the area of the planet blocking the area of the star, and that ratio is one ten thousandth. So Kepler has a remarkable and frankly unprecedented ability to detect Earth-sized planets around regular stars that it's staring at, and it is indeed staring at a patch of the sky continuously near the constellation Cygnus. There's Lyra, there's Cygnus, obviously a swan in the night sky. Um, and indeed, if you walk out tonight at the end of the talk, if you look no, more or less straight up, you'll see a very bright star. That's Vega, and right next to it is the constellation Cygnus, the Northern Cross. It's right overhead uh, this time of the year, and indeed, that's why tonight I'll be going back after this talk to use the Keck telescope in Hawaii, which we operate from UC Berkeley, uh, to to do follow-up observations of Kepler stars because it's up right now over, overhead at night. Here's the field of view of Kepler, 10 degrees by 10 degrees. Uh, you can see uh, the, the many CCD detectors, 42 of them, uh, which we use to take these pictures. And one of the most special stars that we noticed very early on is called Kepler 10. And I want to introduce to you this star Kepler 10 because the data we took on it with Kepler and the follow-up data tells an extraordinary story. So I'm going to zoom in on the Kepler field near Kepler 10. There's Cygnus, there's that swan. Uh, there's the Kepler field of view. We haven't stared anywhere else for now over two years. And now I'll zoom in on Kepler 10, and I would like to invite you to notice how many stars there are in the field of view of Kepler. Indeed, over 150,000 stars are being monitored. And there's Kepler 10. So out of all those stars, this one caught our attention, and now I want to show you why. And I'm going to show you some technical plots. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to show you the real science that the Kepler science team looks at and writes a computer code to analyze. And if you look carefully at this graph, you'll see it's a graph of the brightness of the star Kepler 10 over the course of time. About 250 days are shown here. And if you look carefully, and I'll invite all of you to make the discovery for yourself, you'll see something remarkable. First, on the y-axis, look at this, thank you, that would be great. Uh, that's wonderful. On the y-axis, we've put the average brightness of the star to be 1. But look at the number on the y-axis, 0.9995 of 1. So you're only seeing brightness fluctuations of a few parts per 10,000 in the scatter of the points uh, up and down. But if you look carefully, you'll see that there are brief moments when the star dims and then returns back to full brightness quite quickly. And I'll let you look. And this would be a signature of a planet crossing in front of the star as it orbits the star repeatedly crossing in front of the star. So if you think you've seen the planet, let me now reveal to you where it is. Right there. I'll uncover it. You notice how it it dims and then dims again and dims again and dims again. And the amount of dimming you can read off with your eye, it goes down to 0.999, well, 5, roughly speaking. So this is a planet that blocks something like 5 ten thousandths of the area of the star. So it's a quite small planet. In fact, you can show that it's only a couple, three times bigger than the Earth. So it's a very small planet, quite special uh, because of its small size. But that's not why I'm showing you these data. There's something else in here that you can only see if you zoom in. If you zoom into a little piece of data right there, here's the zoom in. There's what we had been looking at, and now down in the lower right is the zoomed in. And now you see one of the dimmings is shown in, in the blue. But now if you look carefully, you might be able to see another planet that we hadn't already mentioned and noticed. So if you look carefully, you'll see a dimming, and then another dimming, and then another one, and another one, another one. No more than about one part in 10,000, 0.0001 on this scale. Let me now reveal to you that planet there. 
So you can see by eye the planets in the Kepler uh, photometry. It's extraordinary that you can literally look at the data and see the planets because every time the planet crosses in front, it blocks a little of the starlight. You know the orbital period of the planet by looking at the data by eye. You can see that in this case, you're only seeing 10 days of data. And so something like every day or so, the planet crosses in front. This planet has an orbital period. One year is just about a day or so. In fact, it's 0.84 days is the orbital period. This is a, a planet hugging very close to its star, whipping around the star very quickly, taking less than a day, something like 20 hours to go around the star. And if you take all of those dimmings and you plot them on top of each other, here's what the dimming looks like. You see there's the brightness of the star and then there's a dimming in the middle and then constant brightness again. And the point is that you can see how beautiful these Kepler data are. You wouldn't normally think of raw data like this being aesthetically pleasing, but I find this gorgeous. Uh, and, and you can see why this beautiful dimming, you can smell the planet crossing in front of the star, and then the planet you know, crosses over the star, and then the planet emerges from the star with that slope there. You can, you can just s almost visualize the planet just by looking at the brightness data. It's amazing. Now there's more, of course. The amount of dimming tells you how big the planet is. And in this case, the dimming, as I say, is 0. 0.00015 of the normal brightness, 1.5 parts per 10,000. And that immediately tells you the size of the planet turns out to be 40% uh, bigger than the Earth, 1.4 Earth radii. And by the way, that is the world's record. This is the smallest planet ever found, still to this day, uh, validated, confirmed around another sun-like star. This is the smallest one. It's not exactly the size of the Earth, but it is obviously tantalizingly close to a planet that has the same size or nearly the same size as our own planet Earth. Uh, that's amazing in and of itself, uh, but there's more. And, and I'll show you a little bit more. Here is the summary so far. We watched a planet cross in front of the star by measuring the brightness of the star as seen in the lower graph. But we can also make Doppler measurements of the star, the host star itself. Why in the world would you want to make Doppler measurements, measure the Doppler shift of the light waves? Well, the reason is if you measure Doppler shifts of the star, you can tell whether the star is coming at you or going away from you. You all know the Doppler shift. For those of you who are not big time scientists, you, you know that the train whistle changes its pitch when the train goes by you. Ooh. So it, even with your eyes closed, you can tell the Doppler shift is uh, sending a signal to your brain that the train is either approaching or receding. And so it is with light waves from a star. You can tell whether a star is approaching us at the Earth or receding. Why would a star wobble around like that? Well, because it's being yanked on gravitationally by this supposed planet. As the planet goes around the star, it pulls on the star gravitationally, and you see the star respond for every action. There's an equal and opposite reaction. So we should see the Doppler shift vary, just like a sort of a, a police uh, officer monitoring the, the speed of the star with a radar gun. And here's, in fact, the graph of the speed of the star over the course of time, and you can see the star did change its velocity upward and then downward and then upward again. This star indeed is being yanked around by its little planet, even though it's only 1.4 Earth radii, just as you would have predicted. And that tells us the mass of the planet, because of course the more massive the planet, the more strongly it yanks gravitationally on the star. And you can use Newton's laws of physics and you get 4.5 times the mass of the Earth, bulk mass of the Earth. So now we know two things about this planet. Its size in radius and its mass based on the Doppler measurements. And if you put those two together, you can determine therefore the density of the planet. Remember, mass of an object divided by the volume of an object is density. And in this case, we get 8.8 .8 grams per cubic centimeter. 8.8 .8 grams per cubic centimeter. Well, at first, that doesn't mean a thing to me, 
But if you think back to your high school chemistry days, can you remember your high school chem? My, my high school chemistry teacher said, remember one thing, water has a density of one. One gram per cube is about all I can remember from high school chemistry. But that's pretty good because this planet has 8.8 .8 times that density. And indeed, the planet Earth, our planet Earth, has a density of 5.5 grams per cubic centimeter. So this is a planet slightly more dense even than our planet Earth. And so it's surely a solid planet, indeed a planet made of material that's slightly more dense than our solid planet Earth. It is a rocky planet, the first definitively rocky planet, I would suggest, ever found around a sun-like star. We've depicted it uh, as seen here, a solid planet. Uh, we know its mass, radius, and density. We've given it a little reddish tinge because perhaps the higher density is partly due to a, a higher than average admixture of iron and nickel, the, the heavier elements that would give it the higher density. And we've even uh, constructed a, a movie, or at least NASA has, so here's a, a little uh, animated movie of what we think the star and its planet looks like. There you see the planet in uh, silhouette, the thing that blocked one part in 10,000 of the light of the star. One side of the planet is blowtorched by the star because remember this planet is so close to its star. It's very hot, about 1500 degrees Celsius. And on the back side it's frigid cold because the back side of the planet is just looking out into the black cold darkness of the universe. And then NASA has put in some white flecks of snow for reasons I have no idea. <laughs> What's the orbit of the planet? What's the size of the orbit? It's uh, about one-fiftieth the size of the Earth's orbit. One-fiftieth the Earth's orbit around the sun. And you can see that the animators at NASA have watched too much Star Wars. <laughs> But it's a solid surface, for sure. Maybe it has plate tectonics, uh, maybe volcanism because it's so hot on the surface. It would be extraordinarily wonderful to someday send a spacecraft and get close-up pictures to find out what such a scorched, rocky world might actually be like. So that's what we think Kepler-10 looks like. Um, but Kepler, the spacecraft, has found much, much more. And with that as the backdrop, let me now show you some of the highlights just in the last few months that Kepler has announced. One of them is that we've announced over 1,200 planet candidates. We call them conservatively candidates because we haven't verified that they really are planets in most cases, but I can promise you that 90 to 95 percent of them really are uh, planets. A few of them are false positives, which is normal for a science experiment. If you uh, plot up a histogram of their sizes, which I'll show you in a minute, most of the planets are nearly the size of the Earth. This is utterly unprecedented, extraordinary information. For the first time in human history, we know that small Earth-sized planets are far more common than the larger planets. I'll tell you about that in a moment. And we have found many, indeed over 170 stars, that have two or three or four planets or more even. And I'll be telling you a little bit about that as well. So here's sort of the summary. Remember that out of 150,000 stars we've been monitoring for planets around any of them and here they are. Every yellow dot in the field of view is a Kepler star for which we've already found at least one planet and in this plot I've color-coded them. So the blue dots are the planets that are nearly Earth-sized. Look at all the blue dots there are plausibly Earth-sized planets. The green are planets a little bigger than Earth, 1.25 to 2.0 Earth sizes. A lot of green dots. The universe is just overflowing with planets of nearly the size of the Earth. And then the orange dots are Neptune-sized. The red dots uh, represent the, the gaseous giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn, and there's plenty of those too. So the universe is filled with a diversity of planet types from small nearly Earth-sized ones up to Jupiters and even super Jupiters. And here's another depiction of them. Remember, each one of these planets was discovered by the dimming of its host star 
as the planet crossed in front. So we know uh, what kind of an orbit the planet is in, what its orbital period is, and what its size is. And so we've depicted it in this uh, graphic that you see here with all of the stars. We even know, of course, the size of the host star and the colors of the host star from the measurements we've been making. So you can see the different sizes and colors of the stars and the sizes of the planets that are going around them. It's an incredible avalanche of planetary information, utterly unprecedented. We've never had anything like this magnitude or quality of information about planets around other stars. Now with a little apologies, I can't help but show you some fairly couple of geeky plots that are precious. Uh, so I hope you'll bear with me. This is a graph that shows the occurrence rate, how many planets we found for different sizes of planet. Some of the planets are smaller, some of them are bigger. And on the x-axis, I have the size of the planet in Earth units. From the size of the Earth at the far left, 1.0, all the way up to 22 times the size of the Earth. But the graph shows how many planets we found at each one of those sizes. And the takeaway message here is that the big planets that are roughly 10 times the size of the Earth, like Jupiter, they're rare. There are Jupiters out there, there are Saturns, but they're far rarer than are the smaller planets of one or two times the size of the Earth. And you can see the graph, you even see some error bars. The take home message is utterly profound. When you look up into the night sky at the twinkling lights as you will when you walk out of here tonight, there are far more of the nearly Earth-sized planets than there are of the giant Jupiter-sized planets. The, the, the galaxy is teeming with the small ones. And moreover, you can ask, how many planets are there for stars of different sizes? Let me say that again. How many planets are there as a function of the star's size, the host star's size? And so you see on the x-axis, stars the size of the sun. I gave that a 1.0. Right in the middle is the solar size. But the stars that are bigger than the sun have fewer planets. And in contrast, at the left, the stars smaller than the sun have more planets. And in particular, more of these small planets, the ones that are two to four uh, Earth radii. So in fact, what we're learning is something we hadn't even imagined, which is that stars smaller than the sun have more of the small planets, the size of the Earth, or nearly so, than do the bigger planets. So this is an amazing clue because most of you probably know that our Milky Way galaxy has more of the smaller stars than the bigger stars. So this very popular numerous type of star, the smaller stars, are the ones that have more of the smaller planets. It's an amazing result. It's so amazing that we want to check it. It looks convincing here, but it's so remarkable that in the next year or two we will take more measurements with Kepler and try to verify this. Now, in addition, Kepler has been finding stars that have more than one planet orbiting the star. And by the way, by more than one planet, I mean more than one planet that crosses in front of the star, transiting the star, dimming the star, so that we can detect it with Kepler. And the prize winner so far is Kepler 11. And you see an artist's rendering of it here. Six different planets all cross in front of the star. Here's the depiction of the Kepler-11 system. There's the six planets, all residing in a nearly flattened plane. And here's our solar system for comparison, Mercury and Venus. You see, these are six planets compactified within a realm uh, no bigger than Venus's orbit around the sun. An amazing, compact, six-planet system. And here's an animation showing what it looks like. You see the star dimming at odd times as planets cross in front of it. It's like some sort of a NASCAR auto race or something. <laughs> Who's winning? Can you see moons? We've not detected any moons yet, nor rings. We're looking, though. So this is amazing, but this is just one example of a multi-planet system that Kepler has found. 
Uh, there's another one here. Here's a, a star with uh, two planets. Quite remarkable. I wanted to point this out to you. This is a special treat. These two planets are not only gravitationally yanking on the host star and vice versa, but the two planets yank gravitationally on each other. And so as the planets go around the star, they lead or lag depending on how they've yanked themselves. So the idea is this, that if you have a star with a single planet, the planet of course goes around the star like clockwork. You could set your watch by when it is that a planet crosses in front of the star there. And then uh, again right there. Planets orbiting, obeying Newton's laws of physics will uh, orbit with exactly the same duration of every orbit. But what if instead the star has two planets orbiting it? If there are two planets, then the planets will yank gravitationally on each other, sometimes holding one of them back or maybe yanking one of them forward so that they arrive a little late or a little early. And we're detecting these lead and lags in the arrival of the planet with Kepler. See, there's one that came a little early, and now here comes the planet again a little late, and then again a little early. And the reason is the planets are literally yanking on each other, varying the orbital period, and we detect this very clearly with Kepler. So we're actually seeing the presence and, the, and able to measure the masses of other planets in the system because of their effects on each other. This is an utterly new technique. We call it transit timing variations. And it's really going to transform how we study the architectures of multi-planet systems. But meanwhile, we're detecting a lot of stars that have multiple planets. And here they all are. From Kepler, there are now 170 stars that show two or more planets that transit, that dim the star, never mind the other planets that are out of the plane that don't transit, and you can see them all here. In these graphs, this is real data, you're seeing the stars at the center, it's, it's, we left it dark, but you're seeing the size of the orbit and the relative size of the planets by the size of the dots, and moreover, we know exactly when a planet crosses in front of its star, and so we know that ticking clock. We can predict in the future where along an orbit every one of those planets must be, even in the future, because we can predict uh, based on what we've seen so far. So we know the orbital period and exactly where they are, what we call the orbital phase, uh, around in their circles. So it's an amazing sort of menagerie, a clockwork. And let me now show you where all the planets will be in the future. This is actually science. This is not laughable. <laughs> it's an incredible thing. This is an actual prediction with very high accuracy of exactly where each of the planets is around each of the stars. Some of them are very close in, orbiting very quickly. They look silly. Others are in quite slow, wide orbits way out here like this. But this is the kind of uh, is, is uh, sort of a flood of planetary information and you might even call it architectural information because for each one of these systems we're learning their structure and the sizes of the planets. It's an amazing flood and you can see now why Kepler has transformed uh, the field of planetary science just in the last few months. Now um, to summarize so far Kepler is finding planets nearly the size of the Earth, and there are indeed more of those smaller planets. This is, I think, a historic result. But I'd like to move on to the second uh, portion of my talk on something that's more speculative, and that is, what about planets that are suitable for life? What fraction of the planets have the right conditions for biology? Uh, and what are, we, what, what are those conditions? What are the, the sorts of environmental factors that render a planet uh, habitable? Well, we, we know one factor that really does matter, and that's temperature. If your Earth-sized planet is too close to its host star, the host star will warm up the planet too much, and it will be too hot. Any water on that planet 
will be uh, evaporated into steam and you won't have the liquid water that you need for life. On the other hand, if an Earth-sized planet is too far from its host star, it will receive too little starlight and be too cold. The water, if any, would be frozen into ice and snow. Again, not suitable for uh, life as we know it. It's planets in between in the so-called habitable zone that will have uh, just the right temperature so that water will be in the liquid form. So certainly, at least biology as we know it, and obviously all of you could raise your hand at this stage and say, yeah, but what about biology that we don't know about? Nonetheless, with regard to biology, we do have some appreciation of it's this habitable zone where water would be liquid that represents a clear foremost property of an Earth-sized planet that is required as far as we know for life as we know it. But what other properties might be necessary for a habitable world? Chemistry, geology, atmospheres. Well, there's no better way to understand the properties needed for habitability than to go to one of the least hospitable places on the surface of the Earth, namely our beloved national park, Yellowstone. And indeed, I'm going there next week to go again to look at the uh, hot springs, which I'll show you in a second. Because as you all know, in Yellowstone, the water comes out of the ground steaming, boiling hot, nearly so. In the winter, there's five meters of snow. The organisms, the life forms at Yellowstone must endure both boiling temperatures and freezing temperatures just within six months. And then just to give life a kick in the pants, the water is highly acidic. How could life ever thrive in such a hideous, uh, thermally and uh, acidic and alkaline, uh, bizarre environment? Well, it turns out it does thrive, uh, as probably most of you know. When you go to the hot springs like here, you see different colors coming off of the hot springs. You see it with your own eyes. And each color represents a different uh, species of bacteria with its own pigment that, <clears throat> that thrives in the temperature and acidity domain of that flow line. So each type of bacteria is proliferating in the temperature and acidity of its uh, choosing and then it thrives and reproduces. Uh, if you want to even add to the misery of these bacteria, you simply bring a uh, pH paper that you steal from your high school chemistry teacher's lab room and you dunk that pH paper in the water. You can see the colors there in the background. Still, that's the, the bacteria enduring the, the, the nearly boiling temperatures. And you read off the pH. It turns out to be two in about half of the hot springs in Yellowstone. You can just verify what the biologists have been studying and saying for a couple of decades now. And there you see, whoops, there you see in the background this lovely, beautiful, filamentous uh, bacteria like angel hair uh, pasta. And yet it's thriving despite nearly boiling temperatures and an incredibly high acidity near battery acid like acidity. Uh, one of my favorite hot springs is uh, the Grand Prismatic Spring. You hike up, uh, go off the trail, don't tell the park ranger, go off the trail, go up in the mountain here. You see volcanic rocks uh, in the foreground and there's this lovely hot spring with the steam coming off and the different colors showing you that the bacteria are as happy as can be despite the crazy uh, and bizarre conditions there. And in fact, my favorite hot spring, which I can't wait to go to in a couple of weeks when I get there, is Churning Cauldron. You can see how it got its name. Just look at the water there churning, boiling, gurgling. I didn't dare uh, place the pH paper held between my fingers in churning cauldron. So I tied the pH paper to a black metal clip that you can see. And then I tied the black metal clip to a string. And I tossed that thing into churning cauldron to see you know, what the pH would come out to be. I didn't know. And, and I pulled this thing out. Um, and, and there's the pH paper, it came out two, battery acid again, and indeed look at what was a black clip. <laughs> and then as if to laugh in our human faces, look at the string. <laughs> the critters just clung to the string that were happy swimming, living their lives out in that nearly boiling acidic water. So you can be a little amateur biologist when you go to Yellowstone with nothing more than pH paper and a thermometer. It's really terrific and you can just tell how happy the, the bacteria are living their lives out there. These, cr these microscopic critters with lovely names that tell you how much they enjoy the heat 
uh, are sending us an astrobiological message. They don't come from 25 light years away. They're right here in our backyard. And they're telling us that if there are other Earths out there with crazy temperatures, wild acidities, less sunlight, more sunlight, maybe not very much oxygen, whatever, there will be life forms that nonetheless endure and actually uh, thrive. And so these, these un, uh, unintelligent life forms are sending us one of the most intelligent messages we could have ever gotten essentially from outer space, but doing so from right here in the uh, extreme environments on the Earth. And so the message is clear, right? Uh, on almost any Earth-like planet where the temperature allows water to be in liquid form, all of the ingredients for life are common. The, the recipe for life is clear. You need a petri dish within which to mix up the chemicals, the organic molecules, and indeed the uh, ingredients for life, the, the carbon-based uh, molecules, uh, the methane, ethane, uh, and other carbon-based molecules, organic molecules, very common in the universe. And you need to mix them up with some sort of a solvent, some cocktail mixer, if you will, like liquid water. Maybe some other liquid can do the job as well. And then you need to mix in a little energy so the reactions can take place. And so very simply, the, the, uh, the, the, the kitchen elements are there for you to cook up life on any such planet, never mind the acidity and the temperature and detail. And of course, there are many energy sources, so don't even worry about that. There's uh, radioactive energy, tidal energy, geothermal energy, never mind stellar solar-like energy. And so the molecular biologists are unanimous. If you take a poll of molecular biologists throughout the world and ask, do you think there's microbial life out there in space? They'll kind of wince at such an obvious question because they are very sure the answer is sure. You're going to get organic molecules forming amino acids. We already see them in the comets. Uh, and then the interstellar clouds. You're going to eventually get proteins and eventually get replicating molecules that replicate and compete for the available resources uh, in their environment. So there's no question, I would say, at least from our intellectual uh, theoretical standpoint, no question that simple uh, single-celled life ought to be common as far as we know. But then that brings me to the last part of the talk. <laughs> about which I know nothing at all. <laughs> and that has to do with intelligent life. And it is really, it's, um, it's embarrassing that we, to this day in 2011, don't know much about the possibilities of intelligent life, technological life, elsewhere in the universe. I'll tell you a few thoughts that I have, and they're sort of my own personal view. Uh, not necessarily shared by everybody, but, but I'll try to mix in some alternate points of view. When you look at our Milky Way galaxy and you ask, is it teeming with life as Gene Roddenberry depicted in Star Trek? Are the Romulans and the aliens, or Romulans and the, and the Klingons and the, the Cardassians fighting each other and engaged in commerce and, you know, cordoning off quadrants of the galaxy and so on? Are there, are there salesmen out there who are really ready to bilk you out of your, your spaceship and so on? Well, you know, you can do some simple calculations to ask if Roddenberry was right. There's 30 billion, at least 30 billion planetary systems in the Milky Way galaxy, just based on the Kepler information I've shown you. 200 billion stars, so there's 30 billion planetary systems, at least, probably more. And then you might ask, well, what fraction of those planetary systems harbors intelligent, and let's be more specific, technological life. What fraction of those planetary systems spawns primitive life, which then evolves into intelligent life? Nobody knows the answer to this question. I think the most pessimistic answer I ever heard was from Frank Drake, who said, the worst it could be is one in a million. Maybe intelligent life is one in a million. So let's take Frank's pessimistic view. If you take one in a million and you multiply by 30 billion, you can Im immediately see there's thousands, tens of thousands of advanced technological civilizations. And I do mean advanced because, of course, many of them uh, got their intelligence a million years ago or 10 million years ago or even maybe 100 million years ago. They would be tens of millions of years advanced 
technologically compared to us uh, humans that just got radio technology a century ago. So it's pretty impressive to think that, well, maybe Roddenberry had a point. That's a lot of civilizations. Maybe this idea that we saw on TV was basically correct. But is that true? You know, you, you all look up into the night sky and, and we don't see alien spacecraft routinely. Yes, there are claims of UFOs. They're always made by farmers in Iowa. I don't know why it is that, that it's the corn farmers in Iowa that see all the UFOs. None of the rest of us get to see them. But other than the Iowan farmers, you know, we actually don't see this. We don't see it with our telescopes. The, the, the galaxy isn't so teeming with life that the, the alien spacecraft reveal themselves. And so that begs the question, well, what would we have seen if the galaxy were teeming with life? And you start realizing that actually we do have some non-detections at our fingertips uh, for these advanced technological species. For one thing, the moon does not have an obelisk as we all saw in 2001. There's no crash debris there. Maybe they wouldn't have come to the moon, but maybe they would have. The moon represents a non-detection. There's no telescopes left there by the Cardassians 500 million years ago to watch the evolution of us humans. Similarly, the planet Mars now has been photographed very nicely. Indeed, we have two spacecraft orbiting Mars right now. And we have meter scale photographs of Mars. And there are no cities. There's, there's no telescopes down there. No advanced civilization came and left a, a telescope to monitor us on the Earth or even monitor Mars. So there's another non-detection, you might say. And one of the greatest non-detections of advanced uh, technological life is right here on the Earth. Certainly the Earth has been a Shangri-La for advanced life forms for several billion years. There have been uh, beachfront property and tropical rainforests on the Earth far before the, the Homo sapiens and the Australopithecine arrived here. And yet no advanced life form came and, and you know, came from uh, Tau Ceti and set up camp here on the Earth. So the Earth is sort of a giant non-detection of advanced technological life. You could argue about these things, of course. Moreover, every night, professional astronomers all over the world use their professional telescopes. They're aimed at different stars and galaxies. If any UFO were to appear in their field of view, I, I would see it tonight when I'm looking through the Keck telescope. I'll be watching the field of view. Never in my experience, nor any other professional astronomer's experience, have we seen a spacecraft or some alien peering back through the telescope at us. It just doesn't happen. Again, that's where the, the Iowa farmers seem to have the best telescopes in the world. Um, the night sky doesn't show the gamma rays from the matter-antimatter engines of the Enterprise and, and other such craft. So at least there's no indication of that kind of propulsion system. And moreover, when we look up into the night sky here around the Earth, we don't see even simple, small, robotic spacecraft sent here from the advanced civilizations that exist maybe within tens of light years, who that sent a very simple camera to kind of spy on the Earth. Why don't we see their, their, their uh, spacecraft, their satellites kind of watching over us? We just don't see them. And then it's somewhat embarrassing to say, here we are in the SETI Institute, clearly one of the greatest scientific institutions <coughs> on the planet Earth, and despite our best efforts, we have not succeeded in something like over 40 years to pick up the radio waves from the advanced civilizations. It's extremely frustrating. And, and it, all of these factors start sending a message that maybe the galaxy is not teeming with advanced technological life. It's out there for sure. We can't, we, we can't argue against it. They, there must be some smart critters out there somewhere. But it, it, maybe their density is lower than we thought. We've made some overestimate. The Gene Roddenberry's of our mind have somehow overestimated how common advanced life is. Uh, and maybe we can figure out how we did that overestimate because the aliens would have wandered here by chance if they were out there, even if they didn't know where to go. So how might it be that we've kind of you know, been overly enthusiastic about the density, the com how common intelligent life is. Well, I'll just offer a few ideas, and these are really just my own personal ideas about it. It's possible that our planet Earth is a little more special, maybe greatly more special than we thought, and this is arguable. 
One of the attributes, for example, indeed, is water. It's not just that the Earth has liquid water, yeah, that's a prerequisite for life as we know it, but the Earth has just the right amount of water. 0.06% by, by weight uh, is, the, is the Earth in the form of water, plus or minus a little. And if you can imagine, if the Earth somehow had delivered to it by comets and asteroids less water, let's say a factor of two, so it was 0.03% water, well then much of that water would have been soaked into the sponge of the mantle of our planet Earth, maybe even into the core, and the surface would have far less water than it does, maybe drying it up completely, and we would be in a desert world. You might say, desert world? Oh, come on, what are the chances of a, of a terrestrial planet being a desert world? Well, Venus and Mars, our two neighbors on either side, have no water on the surface at all. So we have two desert worlds right in our backyard. And moreover, you could ask, well, what if the Earth had somehow acquired a little bit more water? Not 0.6%, but maybe twice that much. Well, then there, the oceans would be so deep that the continents would be nearly covered. Yeah, maybe Mount Everest would poke out above the water world. And we'd be living on a planet that was like a, uh, you know, a bad Kevin Costner film. <laughs> so, you know, it's possible that our planet Earth is a sort of one in a thousand throw of the dice. Not one in a billion maybe, but one in a thousand. We have just the sliver of veneer of water so that the plate tectonics allows the continents to poke out above, the oceans keep... Without that, you might argue that technological life would be challenged. How could we build, uh, you know, electronics, never mind pianos and rocket ships, uh, if we had a world covered by water? The, the circuits would short out sort of literally and metaphorically. Another interesting aspect of the uh, paucity of intelligent life in the galaxy comes in Darwinian evolution. If you ask the world's greatest evolutionary biologists, are big brains a natural byproduct of Darwinian evolution? Are we humans at the pinnacle of the Darwinian evolutionary tree, like we like to think of ourselves? They are fairly unanimous in saying no, that we humans have attributes that have somehow allowed us to compete in our environment, but that intelligence is just one of tens of thousands of properties that an animal can use to compete. Hard shells, long necks, fast running speed, long teeth, many, many other attributes allow a species to compete, not just big brains. And there's no better example of this, um, uh, how shall I put it, humility of, of, of brain size than looking at the paleontological record of the dinosaurs. Over 200 million years of dinosaur evolution yielded brains the size of chicken brains. It's incredible. 200, we humans have been, you know, we've been, uh, since the Homo erectus, it's only 100,000 years or so. The dinosaurs had 200 million years by which Darwinian evolution could have yielded a slightly smarter dinosaur from one generation to the next. Even smarter by a smidgen would have allowed the dinosaurs to outcompete each other by virtue of their intelligence. And yet, at the end of dinosaur evolution uh, 65 million years ago, uh, the smartest dinosaurs had, the, had, had brains that were literally, the, the biggest was the size of that of an ostrich. And in fact, that, that's been measured. You can take the cranial sizes of dinosaurs. And the biggest, the smartest of the dinosaurs was the Trudon. And there's a, 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 a model of the Trudon's brain. And there's an ostrich uh, brain and an albatross brain. And indeed, we know today that dinosaurs um, are birds, or maybe I should say birds are dinosaurs. So it's not surprising that dinosaurs really uh, more or less had the brains uh, of birds. And, and you can even graph where the dinosaurs sit relative to the mammals and body weight and uh, cranial size relative to body mass and so on. So this is a poignant moment where you realize that intelligence uh, was not an obvious driver uh, for the uh, properties of this species, the, the reptiles, for 200 million years. And maybe that's true in general. Maybe intelligence is just something that's a, a quirk. We're, we're a twig on the evolutionary tree. We're not at the pinnacle. And then, of course, 
We all know that even some of the animals that we know and love today, like bugs and dogs and cats, they certainly aren't getting any smarter with time. They're just as smart as they need to be. My friend Lori Marino likes to say that even the dolphins, which are smart, but they're just as smart as they need to be. So there's not a lot of evolutionary pressure. And I think what's exciting too are the, um, the, the species on the earth that have no brains at all. And they have done perfectly well. Thank you very much. The jellyfish are not just boneless, they're brainless. And they have survived for a billion years, never once developing a cerebral cortex. So there's a clear evidence that uh, species can thrive and even evolve, but brains and technology may not be a, pr a necessary uh, end product of evolution. And then one of the ideas that Carl Sagan used to talk about, and I think it's lovely and, and profound, is that maybe part of the reason there is a paucity of intelligent species out there is that once they have the uh, technological abilities to build rocket ships, they also endanger their environments. They can build weapons, biological, chemical, nuclear. Uh, and so perhaps their lifetimes are finite. Maybe intelligent technological species last typically 10,000 years or so, which would be great if we can live that long. And then they uh, flicker in and out like uh, lights on a Christmas tree uh, throughout the galaxy. So that's, a, I think, a cautionary tale about the challenge we humans face as an intelligent species. Maybe we should be much more careful about uh, how we treat ourselves. And then I think I'll just finish tonight by saying that uh, these topics of the so-called paucity of intelligent life, it's certainly out there, but how common is intelligent life? Are, they, uh, are there a hundred intelligent civilizations in our Milky Way? Are there a thousand of them? Are there maybe only two or three, maybe even only one? We can only answer that question by doing the experiment. We absolutely must build as one of our greatest causes uh, as a species ourselves, we must pursue the search for other uh, intelligent uh, critters out there like ourselves. And uh, a lovely um, uh, new radio telescope is being built near Mount Lassen, the uh, Paul Allen Radio Telescope Array. Uh, you can see some depictions of it here. And of course, we now know where to point the Allen Telescope Array because we have some of these Earth-sized planets found by Kepler. So we actually know where the Earths may be, and we can then uh, search for radio and television transmissions <coughs> from those in intelligent species, if any, on those planets. But there's a, there's a, a sobering s a news flash uh, to, to provide all of you with. Some of you know this, that the Allen Radio Telescope Array is currently struggling to find funding. It's just very hard to find enough money uh, to build and operate uh, these lovely new high-tech radio telescope arrays with which we could pick up the, the uh, technological signals of other civilizations. So we need help. There's just no doubt about that. And, and hopefully somebody, maybe in this audience or somebody uh, that's, that will listen to this talk, will realize that a great quest of humanity is, is, is struggling for lack of funds. And there are other ways to do SETI, searching for uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. One is using uh, modest telescopes, uh, but putting special uh, light detectors that can detect lasers. Uh, perhaps the alien civilizations uh, transmit communication signals to their brethren on another planet or on another spacecraft by laser light to maintain some degree of privacy and intensity of their communications. So uh, there are people, uh, here's Shelley Wright, uh, Professor Shelley Wright, now a professor at University of Toronto, using a telescope here in Northern California at Lick Observatory, where she's attempting to pick up laser signals uh, from other intelligent species. She's also using a Berkeley uh, telescope over there. Uh, here's one of her designs. She's just finished a, a proposal. She too needs funding to carry out her SETI search. So this is part of a, a proposal to NASA, but you know it's hard to get money uh, these days out of the federal agencies. And then I myself am, am trying to do a little of this. Uh, we're using the Keck telescope in Hawaii uh, to hunt for laser lines. And this is a somewhat complicated graph, but that little dot there is what we would see if an alien uh, civilization happened to be shining its laser by luck somewhere toward the Earth, we would pick up 
a little dot in the uh, confined in wavelengths, i.e. colors, and confined in angle in the sky because the laser would be an unresolved dot. And so we're beginning to look for these laser dots in our data. It's a long shot for sure, but if you don't look, you'll never find one. That's just the way it is. So I'll finish by saying that we're, we are in a special moment. I think this is an amazing moment in human history. We're finding the first Earth-sized planets. We have answered, essentially, Aristotle's question. We do know that there are other uh, Earths out there. The Earth is not uh, unique nor special. It's possible that intelligent life is a little more rare than the Star Trek and Star Wars science fiction novelists have told us. Um, primitive life is probably common as far as we can guess from uh, Yellowstone and uh, elementary biology. Technological life may be more rare than we had thought, but if so, it's even more precious. And so it gives us, I think, an impetus to think about our own civilization, how we can survive long enough, indeed, to find those other precious civilizations that are out there. And the bottom line is, only if we devise SETI searches uh, and look, will we be able to answer this question? So I'll stop there. Jeff, I'll just start with the quest, uh, questions. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you'll be doing to follow up the Kepler uh, detections and, and, and what, uh, what is it that you'll be doing at Keck to actually, uh, to, to, to Tonight, perhaps. Well, tonight uh, I'm going to drive away from here. <laughs> and at Berkeley, we have a remote observing facility that allows us to use the Keck telescopes that are on top of the uh, hopefully dormant volcano, Mauna Kea, on the Big Island of Hawaii. And what we're doing there is trying to verify the planets that Kepler finds, because as I mentioned, there's a small probability that we're being fooled. Some of them are certainly not planets, and we know how to sort out which the, the wheat from the chaff. And then also, by watching for that wobble, of the star, we can determine the mass of the planet. And we'd like to get the mass again because the mass plus the size of the planet gives us the density. And we really want to know how common are rocky planets like the Earth because it's that hard surface on which the water can puddle into lakes and oceans serving again as the, as the cocktail mixer for life. So it's, it's getting the mass with the Keck telescope that gives us the, the solid constitution of the planets. And, and once you've done that, does it become a planet rather than a planet candidate? Yeah, once it does that, we go to the Kepler team and we have a vote, actually, to be honest with you. In fact, we, we met in this very room a week ago and we had some votes and, and people say yay or nay, I think it's a planet and hopefully the planet passes unanimously and then it, it gets deemed a planet. Yeah. Uh, certain moon systems in, in this solar system are double moons. Have you observed any double planets? No. Uh, it's a very good question. I think by double planet you mean a star with two planets that are orbiting each other. And I, I could tell you that we probably would detect them with Kepler uh, because we would see one planet dim the star and then the other planet would dim the star. Uh, and then when the whole thing went around they'd be in a different configuration but we would still see one planet and then the other one dimmed the star. Yeah, exactly. We'd see a step function in the brightness. And so far, we, I, we haven't seen that. We, we look by eye at the light curves, as we call them, brightness as a function of time. And so far, we haven't seen, nor moons for that matter. And, and what you're talking about is essentially the same thing as hunting for moons, where we would see maybe one dimming and then another dimming due to the moon. So far, not. And, Maybe, uh, you know, we're going to keep looking, but we have a few te Kepler team members who are specifically hunting for these, for possible moons. Uh, Jeff? Yeah. Um, uh, you made uh, two points I'd like your comment on. One is that uh, you've generalized that, the, that, the, that there are a preponderance of, of smaller planets rather than larger planets, but would you also say that that's only out to two-thirds AU or thereabouts that yes. we've checked so far that actually the full generalization will take, you know, the seven years that we anticipate running Kepler further. And then the second, in terms of big takeaways from Kepler for me, and, and I'd like your comment on it, is that 
is that you've, you've now detected about 1,250 planets, roughly 1% of the stars that you're looking at have um, on an, an average of one planet per per hundred. Right. However, since only one percent of the systems would be edge on and detectable, exactly. consequently there is out to two thirds AU, an average of one planet per star systems, which means oh. that in the Milky Way there must be, you know, four hundred billion plus right. uh, planets. If you extrapolate it out. Yeah. So let me, uh, I'll answer both of those. Your first question, uh, just to recap his question. The Kepler mission has now been going for two years, but we've actually only processed the data because it's very difficult uh, for the first roughly half a year. And so we're only sensitive to planets that would have orbited their star three times to give us a dimming, a second dimming, then a confirmational third dimming if the orbital period were less than about two months or so. And so the data I showed, the graphs I showed, only pertain, as you mentioned, to the close-in planets. And as the Kepler mission acquires more and more data over the years, hopefully another three or four years with more funding, uh, we will be indeed sensitive to planets that take a full year to go around their star like the Earth does around the sun. And so we're going to learn the statistics of the occurrence of planets, the size distribution of planets for those planets that orbit farther from their star, not just the close close in ones. So you're seeing the early the, the early days. And your your other question was was a brilliant one and I'll explain it again. Um, he noted that only about one percent of the Kepler stars show planets. But that shouldn't be the takeaway number because Kepler can only detect planets if the orbital plane is viewed edge on to our line of sight out to the Earth. Any planet that resides in a tilted plane will not cross in front of the star and therefore will not dim the star. So we miss all of those. The good news is this is a simple high school geometry problem. You can ask uh, for all of the planets you did detect, how many would have been in the other orbits tilted randomly that you would not have detected and therefore you can account for them. And when you do that you find that something like 30% of all the stars uh, have a planet within an Earth-Sun distance. You, you used the term AU. So within an Earth-Sun distance, it looks like something like 30 per... Actually, it's accurate because actually I, uh, I wasn't thinking for the moment that you have to make three circuits. Yeah, and exactly. That's right. We're only, so far I've reported only, uh, and the Kepler team has only written papers on planets very close in. That's right. And so the best is yet to come. Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a couple questions about the likelihood of primitive life. One, uh, regarding the uh, harsh environment, the fact that <clears throat> life has seen harsh environments on Earth, but that could be because, I mean, it may be that life evolves or develops in the most favorable environment and then gradually adapts to these harsher environments. So it may, that may not tell you be as quite as, as optimistic. And the other, there was just an article in the New York Times about a, <clears throat> a fellow who developed a replicating organism. And right. I, I thought one of his comments was, was particularly appropriate. He said, it drives him nuts when he hears uh, <clears throat> exobiologists or whatever, or, or, or yeah. astronomers talk about the frequency, he says, I have no idea. I mean, how can they say, how can they come up with any kind of figure? Right. Like you respond to the... No, well, of course, you know, I would 100% agree that we, we simply don't know even about how common primitive life is, because it is still the case we don't really understand the origin of life, the uh, early uh, microbiological steps at the molecular level that led to the primitive life on the earth and until we understand that well it still could turn out that even simple life uh, is is more rare um, than we had thought and your first point was just the, the, uh, the fact that harsh environments may be yeah so well you know it's interesting um, Yellowstone is, 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 is a peculiar place in, in profound ways we think of it as a harsh environment but in fact, the leading hypothesis for the origin, the site at which life formed on the Earth, I would say the leading hypothesis is that it formed in hot volcanic vents at the 
depths of the, the ocean, in the bottom of the ocean. Why? Well, because at the bottom of the ocean, primitive life forms would have been protected from the UV light coming down from the sun in the days prior to having any ozone. And there wouldn't have been any ozone because there was no plant life to photosynthesize oxygen and protect the early life forms. So the best way to form life in a way that's protected is to do it underneath at the bottom of the ocean. So maybe the volcanic conditions we see on Yellow, at Yellowstone are in fact representative of what were the, the suitable, the, the lovely tranquil uh, locations uh, where life got kick-started early on rather than the harsh environment that we think of it today. Actually now I have uh, two questions and an <laughs> observation. Uh, first, uh, about uh, since we were talking about the geometry before, uh, because of the geometry of transits, the likelihood of discovering planets further and further away from the star become less and less. That's exactly correct. Yeah, and I can give you the number for those of you who are mathematical geeks. Um, the probability that a planet orbiting its star will just happen to cross in front of the star as viewed from us at the Kepler telescope is equal to, are you ready, the radius of the star divided by the orbital distance between the planet and the star. So you got a star and the orbital distance and you can see that a star could be quite a bit smaller than the orbital uh, distance of the planet to the star. So that uh, ratio, that, that fraction, is about 1% for the Earth, a planet in an Earth-like orbit. Planets in Earth-like orbits, only 1% of them will be so fortunate as to cross in front of the star and allow Kepler to detect them. Thank you. And the uh, observation I wanted to make was that uh, uh, you observed that uh, there is a uh, predominance of smaller planets out there. Isn't this sort of uh, confirmatory of an accretion model? Yeah, and I'll just fill the rest of you in. One, the leading uh, model for the formation of planets is that um, dust particles floating around in a young protoplanetary disk those dust particles collide, stick, and grow into ever larger blobs of dust. Other dust particles coming in, you end up with a fractal dust bunny, and eventually these things get larger and larger, and they form the size of, of sort of pebbles and asteroids, comets, and eventually planets. And yeah, the fact that you see more of the smaller ones seems consistent with, and there are other reasons to think it's consistent with, this model of the solid dust particles being the, the seeds of planets. As the system ages then, I would expect to see a peak forming as planets will start to sweep out their zones. Yeah, and that's how the theory goes, that planets should carve out gaps in their protoplanetary disks, gravitationally sucking up all the material n near them, and then you get uh, phonograph grooves uh, around the protoplanetary disk. In that one slide that you show the planets going around the various suns, the slide showed them going all counterclockwise. Is that in fact the case? <laughs> yeah, that's because God lives above the planetary system. If God lived below, we'd have them going the other way. So, um, pl please go back to one of the light curves that you you know you showed in the middle of the talk. Um, what um, you know, what I noticed is, even when there wasn't a transit, there was quite a bit of scatter in... You're a mean person. <laughs> You're calling the Kepler data noisy. I don't know how to go back all that way, but uh, the, the, the y-axis, that noise is only one part in 10,000. So the noise fluctuations, I don't know, I guess I should just break out of PowerPoint here. Those noise fluctuations are, are, are just a hundredth of one percent. Uh, I'll see if I can find the graph that you're that you're thinking of here. Um, but now that you've insulted me, I have to go uh, find this Gee, thing. I, uh, I was well-meaning. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I mean, this is 0.999 of the brightness of the star, and here's what you're calling noise. So, right. So so what I what I was getting toward is. What's the um, smallest um, 
planet, you know, that Kepler can yeah. detect, you know, before you get lost in the noise. Yeah, yeah. And, and how does that translate? No, that's a very important question. And um, it, the, the quick version is that we think Kepler can find planets about half the size of the Earth. And that will require that a number of transits, maybe a dozen or 20 transits, so you build up uh, over and over again the dimming. And so that dimmings that are even, let's say, a tenth as deep as this, you would still be able to discern it uh, in the data. And you can sort of see by eye, if this planet is only 40% bigger than the Earth, how small a planet could you in fact detect? And the obvious answer is considerably smaller than this one. Right. And then. Um Another question, the planet that was orbiting once a day, yeah. uh, you said, you know, um, it, it has one side that always faces the sun and the other side that's always that's in blackness. Right. Is there a certain radius with, within which we expect that to be the model? Yeah, that's right. Um, planets that orbit their star and take about five days or less, the theory suggests, and even observations suggest, that there will be tides raised on the planet, a bulge on the planet toward the star, uh, inducing a torque that will cause that planet to keep one face uh, toward the star at all times. Planets more distant than, than a few, uh, 10 days or so, those torques are much smaller, and so the, the, tidal, cup, the tidal coupling is much weaker. Thank you. Hi. I was uh, very interested in the transit timing variations. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering, you know, you, you talked about two scenarios that we wouldn't detect farther out planets. One is if the sun is tilted just a little bit, if the, if the solar disk right. is tilted, we won't see them. Also, obviously, we've only been looking for like a couple of years, and anything with a period of, say, four or five or six or, you know, longer than four years, we may never see that planet. But could those planets be inferred by yes. their variations on the ones that we do see? Yeah, it's a sp beautiful question, and I'll just restate the question because you've almost answered it by virtue of the, the eloquence of the question itself. Um, th th there are, of course, going to be stars for which we see one planet that does transit, and we see the time of transit lead or lag what we would have predicted because of some other unseen planet that's gravitationally yanking on the planet we do detect. And so we will be able to not only infer the existence of other planets, but measure their masses incredibly, despite there being no real data on that other planet at all. It's out of the plane, it's tilted out of the plane, but it will be yanking on this, this uh, seen planet. And by the way, this is not really news, it's about 200 years old, because the discovery of the planet Neptune in our solar system, many of you know, was discovered by watching the timing of the planet Uranus and noticing that it uh, was sort of perturbed in its orbit and that allowed people to infer the existence of and even the location of Neptune uh, before it was ever detected. So we're now doing that with planets around other stars. Yeah, the, the uh, people that planned the Kepler mission chose a direction to look. It's a, it's a fairly sizable chunk of sky, but it's only one chunk of sky. Can you comment on that choice and how likely it would be, or, or how much better that spot is than, say, a, a different random spot in the sky? Yeah, we thought very hard about what patch of the sky to survey. Uh, it goes back 10 years we started thinking about this. And here's the advantage of the field near the Cygnus constellation. As the Earth goes around the Sun and the Kepler spacecraft is trailing behind the Earth, there's a spot perpendicular to the orbital plane where the Kepler telescope can continuously look. If instead the Kepler field of view were somewhere in the plane of the orbit of the Earth, then the Sun would get in the way half, about half the year. So we purposely chose a domain of the night sky uh, near, over, near perpendicular, but there was another key uh, consideration and that is we wanted 150,000 stars and it's the plane of the Milky Way galaxy the wash of stars that goes overhead where the density of stars is so great that the Kepler spacecraft would be able to capture 150,000 stars so there is a spot nearly perpendicular to the orbital plane where the Milky Way goes overhead where in fact we chose to, to observe. In fact we're not right in the plane if you saw the picture uh, because in fact in the plane of the galaxy there's too many stars they're actually too crammed 
together. So we chose a spot a little bit away from the uh, Milky Way. And then the last answer to your question is, well, okay, that's fine up there. What about the equal spot down below? And we chose the one above because here in the United States we have telescopes in the northern hemisphere. And, <laughs> and, and, and that's to our advantage. So the Keck telescope in Hawaii uh, being you know, in northern latitudes uh, allows the Keck telescope to survey the Cygnus constellation like nine months out of the year. So we, at the very last moment, we made a, a small decision that favored the ground-based telescope resources that we had to follow up the Kepler discoveries. Um, with these light curves, uh, I think it's getting, whenever, it's, whenever the planet is, is covering the sun, it gets dark. On the other side, is there a chance it would actually show a blip of light because it's reflecting? And if so, could you look at like the spectral lines and tell a little more about the planet? You should be giving this talk. <laughs> Um, you, uh, let me repeat his question because again he almost gave the answer by virtue of the question. Beautiful question. It's true that when a planet goes in front of a star it blocks a little of the starlight and the star dims and that's how we detect them. But when the planet goes around the backside of a star you're seeing a sort of full moon, which is what you were essentially saying, you not only see reflected light off the planet, now it's fully illuminated, you see the hemisphere that's illuminated, but also that's the hemisphere that's warmed up by the star, and so we get what's called thermal radiation, that is to say infrared light from the warmed up hemisphere. So if you use an optical visible telescope, you see a brightening at, at quote full moon, it's really full planet. And you, if you use an infrared telescope like the Spitzer Spaceborne Telescope, you see a little enhancement of the infrared light as the, the warmed up hemisphere comes into view. And as you said, you're quite right, we can even then take a spectrum, uh, spread the light out from the planet into all of its wavelengths or colors to look for spectral fingerprints of the chemical elements like water, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, and so on, the common molecules of most planets. And that is in fact observed, not for the Kepler stars because they're too faint, but other planets that go around stars for which we've already detected them, we make such measurements. You uh, mentioned one of your other answers that you've only processed data for planets with a period of two months or less, um, and it sort of occurs to me that that can't be anywhere close to the habitable zone right. for any of these stars. That's basically so right. So yeah. at what point do you think that habitable star, uh, zone is going to start in terms of periodicity? Well, we're getting there. You know, just uh, we can do the math in our heads. The, the Earth takes one year to go around the sun, so, and the Earth we normally think of as being near the middle of the habitable zone for a solar type G star. And so we like on the Kepler team to wait for three transits. You see one dimming, that's great. You see a second dimming, is that really due to a planet or could it have just been two random dimmings? But if you see the third one and it's timed, synced up with the first two, then you probably really do have a planet. But that means you have to wait for three orbits which means you have to wait for three years. And the Kepler telescope's only been up for two years and we're a little behind processing the data because it's very complicated. So it'll be another year or two, frankly, before we're sensitive with the Kepler data to uh, planets, indeed including Earth-sized planets, in the habitable zones of sun-like stars. And one last footnote, of course, is that there are stars that are less luminous than our own sun. Those stars are, have such low luminosities that the habitable zone is quite a bit closer in to warm up your face around the campfire when it's dwindling in its light. You better bring your face a little closer to the campfire. And so those, uh, the habitable zone around a dimmer star is closer in and we are already sensitive to the, habitable, the planets in the habitable zone for those low luminosity stars. But there are very few of them. So we, we don't have enough of those stars to get a good statistical sample yet. Oh. Um, I lucked out because you have that chart that I was <laughs> going to ask about. Um, this, is, this light curve is a composite of a bunch of transits. Exactly. Is it correct that any one transit would just have a sudden drop constant low level and then sudden increase. And so what we're seeing is transits through different, uh, different curves through the star's disk. Ah, no. 
yeah, I see what you're thinking. It's a good idea. But um, what is what we suspect is most likely the case is that if you have the disk of a star, the planet, as you suggested, might not cross right across the equator, but instead across at what we call a chord, you know, slicing through the star near the bottom or some way in between the middle and the bottom. But it would do so the same geometry, the same distance, time and time again. So if the orbital plane, for example, is tilted just a little bit, the planet will always cross a little high or a little low over and over and over again. So this curve is what you see for each individual transit. Um, and we're just building it up uh, with many, many more transits. But each one has, an, as we call, an ingress and then a flat bottom and then the egress. And they'll all have exactly that shape. Yeah, there's a brightness variation across the disk. That's what gives this little bowl shaped here. And the ingress is due to the fact that the, the planet uh, nudges its nose, if you will, into the star. And then it takes about a half an hour for the planet to completely get engulfed within the star. So that's the, the duration of the time it takes for the planet to fully go into the disk of the star. And then here's the time it takes for the planet to fully emerge from the star. Ingress and egress, we call them. Oh. Hi. Uh, what would you like to see in a next generation instrument? Oh, boy, am I glad you asked that. So there's two things we need. And this is just glorious because we know the answer. The first thing that we need is a space-borne telescope much bigger than Hubble with a so-called coronagraph that blocks the starlight and allows us to actually see the planets. Notice I didn't show any actual pictures, not even a dot of light. We don't currently have a space-borne telescope, something NASA would build, that can get us a picture of the Earth-like planets around these stars, especially nearby stars, and allow us to take a spectrum of those planets to give us a chemical assessment, a chemical measure of how much of the various molecules, in particular life-bearing or life-related molecules, biosignatures as they're sometimes called. So the first wish list uh, you know, for, for Santa would be a $10 billion space-borne telescope, but that's what it would be. And it would be built uh, in conjunction with ESA, uh, in Europe with Japan, China, and India, and Canada, and other countries combining our resources to build this fantastic, uh, basically epochal telescope that could take the first pictures of and spectra of Earth-like planets around other stars. That's number one on my Christmas list since you asked. Number two is a SETI telescope. We need a telescope like the Allen Telescope Array Frankly, it's only in the realm of $100 million or so. Uh, that would be a spectacular SETI hunting machine that could pick up faint radio and television transmissions from stars you know, halfway across the Milky Way galaxy. Those would be wonderful instruments that I think you know, humanity could be very proud of. OK, if anybody has any final questions, I'd, I'd encourage you to come up here and speak to Jeff after his talk. Jeff, we have a, a mug with a, a picture of potentially one of those instruments that you are wanting for Santa. So it's only a picture, <laughs> but hopefully we can deliver the real thing sometime in the near future. Great. Thanks very much Thank for you. your talk. <laughs>